Good afternoon, everyone. Today is May 21st, Friday. Uh, this is our weekly uh, update for healthcare issues, uh, specifically on Corona uh, and COVID-19. And uh, we are going to speak uh, regarding our uh, United Medical uh, Client Satisfaction uh, results for Q1 2021. And uh, Tanner Fuchs uh, is going to join me in a couple of minutes. And after that, we have Katie and Christina from our client management team, and they are going to discuss the client satisfaction scores with us. And after that, we have my therapy session on the hospital issues and how the nonprofit hospitals are actually uh, taking advantage of the system and making the healthcare more expensive for all of us. Uh, if you are interested in those, we'll have like 40, 45 minute session today. And right after this, uh, we are going to have our bariatric Friday. And that's pretty much uh, what's happening from our side. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and I'm going to do this from that uh, advanced level. No, actually, you know what? I won't do that, Tanner, because we have. Uh, some stuff they are not on PowerPoint. So, um, all right, hoping that everyone can see the screen um, that I'm sharing and I'm actually looking at, yes. So uh, just to give um, uh, our uh, vaccine COVID-19 updates. So Tanner uh, probably now is the most uh, knowledgeable person <laughs> with the vaccine updates. So Tanner, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Kamal. Um, just the, want to start with the updates on the path to uh, herd immunity around uh, both locally, the state and the United States. So this is something we're keeping an eye on um, pretty regularly, week to week. Um, this is just showing where we're at uh, in terms of the average amount of doses that are administered per day on a rolling average, um, with the top left being here locally in Delaware. And then our other graph here showing the national average. So right now, uh, when it comes to the path to herd immunity, Delaware is actually back on pace with the uh, country average as a whole at four months to 75% coverage. So what that looks like in Delaware is roughly a, a little over 4,000 doses of vaccine being administered on a daily basis. And that, like I mentioned, will take us about four months to get to 75% of the population. So the national average is also roughly right around that four months to 75%, um, just under 2 million doses per day. So we'll get to uh, an interesting point here in a little bit about what that means for us uh, at this rate, just under 2 million, um, especially because we know we can see here, we're, we're starting to really bottom out of this dip and hopefully we won't really uh, fall too much underneath this mark because um, it's going to be important going forward to get to that herd immunity level of uh, right around 75%. All right. Um. So this is something else that's pretty interesting to keep an eye on. And this is the amount of or the percent of a population that is vaccinated here in the United States, covering about 43.5 percent uh, of the population uh, has had um, the, their dose of the COVID vaccine. So that mark of 75 percent, that herd immunity mark is our top um, percent there on the uh, y axis and we're, we're coming up here on about 50% of the population, which is uh, exciting. That's a good milestone to hit. Um, and then this is just against the rolling average of percent positive or people that are still testing positive new cases per million, right? So that means um, people who are still testing positive for uh, COVID-19. Um, we're starting to track and we have been for a while seeing that as uh, vaccine administration has increased and more people and more people are getting um, vaccinated, then we are actually seeing that reflected in a decrease in the new cases per million, which is continuing to decrease. And we kind of, of course, expected this as that was the goal. Um, more and more people that are able to get vaccinated as we keep talking about herd immunity. Now, herd immunity is the idea of having enough people vaccinated to where we can safely uh, move around in public without some of these um, social distancing measures, uh, mask measures, things like that, and be comfortable and safe enough to um, have the transmission of the virus reduced to um, lower levels to where you're going to be safe to go out uh, in public. So this is good, uh, good news to keep seeing as the, the, of course, the more population gets vaccinated, we're seeing uh, less and less cases 
um, which is exactly what we were hoping for. So that's good news. Uh, one of the things that's coming up, uh, Tanner, is the 4th of July and then all the holidays. Right. Uh, we uh, encountered, experienced um, uh, some uh, crazy numbers like a couple of weeks after that. So what can you tell us about the uh, 4th of July coming up? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, even before that, we have uh, Memorial Day weekend coming up. And as you mentioned previously with some of the holidays, such as Thanksgiving, Christmas, even as recently as with uh, the spring break and last spring break, uh, even around those times, we were seeing these surges uh, in COVID cases a few weeks later, right? So after the, um, the period in which uh, onset of symptoms come up and people start to get tested, and then we know that that's usually a, in anywhere in between that five to 14 day mark um, or time frame for the vaccine to actually start to display itself uh, in some sort of symptom. And that's when we were starting to see these surges uh, in new people testing positive. So um, uh, kind of similarly, as I was mentioning with the herd immunity, why it's important to make sure that we're still getting and keeping up with the rate uh, at which we are, if not a little bit more vaccines uh, administered on the daily average is we're starting to hear now, uh, as you can see here, uh, recently, Dr. Fauci said in an interview that if about 70%, which is a little under that mark of 75 that we keep discussing, but if 70% of adults can get at least one shot of the vaccine by the 4th of July or around that time frame, we could uh, would then see or avoid a, a surge in new cases after the holiday season. So after those large gatherings, after, you know, a lot of people are going to be out in public, going to restaurants now, getting together, friends and family. Um, so if just 70% could get to one dose of the vaccine by then, he's saying that we could, um, we could minimize the risk of for, uh, running into another one of those surges. And he's pretty confident in it. He's saying um, that almost about incredibly him. quite low of a chance that we wouldn't see that happen. Uh, Tanner, I have some comments about him coming up, but I want you to actually tell us about your uh, next one because uh, they're all coming down to uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, management of this uh, pandemic. So uh, one of the other issues that's not related to 4th of July or the Memorial Day is uh, nurses are not happy with the new mask guidelines. They are not. So what we're seeing here, and we brought this up, uh, I believe it was last week first, um, that the CDC had announced uh, recommendations to relax both the mask guidance as well as some social distancing measures um, while out in public for vaccinated Americans. So what we're seeing here is some of the response coming back now from um, the public uh, and um, some, in this case, the National Nurses uh, Union which is the largest union in the country representing nurses. And they're um, pretty much saying that this is a, a bad decision. Um, so we're getting a lot of confusion, mixed response from this so far, uh, which was kind of expected, I think, just because of the how quick and how um, kind of out of the blue, uh, essentially, this was. I mean, when I first heard it, I was pretty surprised uh, that they were coming out with this now, especially as of recently and seeing that the rates of a administration for vaccine are dropping. So that rate is starting to get um, slower and slower as we increase the amount of people that are getting vaccinated. So there's a lot of uh, questions around it, I think. And I think some of these responses were um, going to be expected, right? So. Um, well, you know, I do have to say, uh, if I don't, then, you know, it wouldn't be a therapy, right? So I don't tell you exactly how I feel about this. Uh, we had ups and downs with uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, he is a year older than my dad. My dad is 80 years old and he is uh, 1940. He was born in Dr. Fauci. Is. So 80 is a lot of age. And I think the job that he has is extremely demanding. And, and I don't want to disrespect anyone who's older than you know, any of the elderly, but including my dad, um, well, if there are some big decision needs to be made, we have to kind of think twice or like, or if he has to still want to drive, he has to get some extra um, uh, clearances, right? So, uh, or if he's just maybe selling all of his uh, real estate with one shot, then they would ask for uh, some doctor's note or something. I think Dr. Fajan needs to step down because with the nurses uh, outraging, outraged uh, 
uh, on the mask issue, they are absolutely right because it's not clear. It's, there's no evidence. Like all of a sudden one day we say, you know what, don't worry about it. Mask is not really needed. That's, uh, we, 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 as you know, we support this, um, these decisions uh, as long, as much as possible. We were the first one who pushed the vaccination process. We did, uh, our physicians did videos um, for vaccination uh, so that more people would trust the vaccine. But this mask issue, I have mixed feelings. And, yeah. and I'm gonna say our nurses uh, of this country. And I think because they are also putting a bigger fight out there on the field, uh, on the floor, uh, in the field on the floor. Um, I think they do have a really good point here, which again, uh, between the old administration and the new administration, I think Fauci is just going back and forth. He doesn't need this job, just step down. I mean, some other 60 year old would take it and do it for another 20 years. I mean, these jobs require a lot of um, number of hours and good focus for these types of issues. How can you really um, manage, well, this, you know, I'm not just limiting this with him, even for the, you know, uh, I'm going to talk mm. about politics. But. Well, it's interesting because I know this uh, is coming originally from the CDC director, and they were saying that this was a, a science-driven decision. So to hear the mixed response, uh, it certainly, um, it, it makes sense that people are kind of back and forth um, on this, especially with, as I mentioned, like, how, um, how unexpected it was for the time. Um, so I, I think it's definitely a, um, a viable response. And to hear, I think, what their response is gonna be coming forward to kind of explain that and to see now, I'm sure we'll start to get data on um, some data that's reflective of the decision here pretty soon. So um, we'll definitely be able to kind of, to have a better grasp on how, um, whether right or wrong, this really was. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna shift gears here. So we are gonna ask our revenue cycle management team members, uh, Katie Needles and Christina Abrams, uh, if they can please join us. All right. So now I'm lucky I have like two beautiful ladies with me. So this is more fun. All right, hi Katie and Christina, how are you guys doing? Good, good, come on, how are you? Good, so would you, like to introduce yourselves. And Christina, this is your first time on uh, on the live uh, event. Uh, Katie, this <laughs> uh, Katie, I think did one or two Katie you did before. Yeah, I did one with you back um, in December about our patient inquiries. So we, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we discussed our uh, revenue cycle management process and we give some information uh, to our uh, existing clients and some uh, prospect uh, clients and now I, I thought today would be a good way to kind of tie this into all the uh, satisfaction scores that we do with our clients and since uh, you guys are uh, first hand handling these uh, I just want to go over those with you and then uh, if there's anything you would like to make any comments uh, while we are going through that I would be more than happy to discuss that so um just so then I can share the PowerPoint here. You guys can see my screen. Let's share our actual, sorry, this is from our database directly. So um, now we, just so that for um, our um, audience would understand, we break our number of questions into six different sections. And then we have the common section so we go through these every month. Uh, we have twice a month uh, department meeting with the RCM team. So now, uh, so Katie, we can start with you. So you can take this question. So uh, go ahead and tell us what this says and then um, we'll go from there. Um, so this is the first question on the survey. So um, the question is, I am satisfied overall with the services provided by United Medical. So it's a pretty straightforward question. As you can see from the results, um, 27 out of 28 of the practices that answered did agree with that. So it's a 96.4 acceptance rate and satisfaction rate. It's pretty straightforward if they're satisfied with the billing. So the revenue cycle, the billing, 
this is the most generalized question, but it's really good to see that 96% are satisfied with the overall services that we provide, whether that's payment posting, billing, um, additional support and business development, et cetera. That is correct. So now I'm gonna go to Christina for the next one. So then we take this overall question and we come down to the communication issues for United Medical. So Christina, tell us about this one. Um, so our second question was, I am overall satisfied with the communication between my organization and United Medical. Um, so out of the 28 reviews that we had received for Q1, all 28 of them were had agreed with the um, question for that. And um, on our end, communication is really important because we need to make sure that we're identifying any trends or anything we're seeing within the billing and communicating that with the doctors to make sure that we're um, helping them improve their overall um, charges going out and increasing the revenue that comes back um, for them. Additionally, in regards to communication, we have been doing our sessions, i.e. like this one now and the sessions that we've been doing with the ACO to make sure that our providers are aware of all the different updates that we have right now, even like through the pandemic, as well as the regular updates that we have on a monthly basis to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that we're meeting the metrics that we need to, to make sure we're properly taking care of our patients in the ACO. And I think uh, one of the most important thing in communication is not just communicating, but time to communication and standard communication. And I think one of the things that we were able to master with our clients and internally in United Medical is uh, we have the communication culture by utilizing our database uh, and being accountable and uh, uh, responsible for what we have. And I do believe that uh, as head of this uh, organization, uh, I don't feel like we have any issues on the communication side. And I do know that every time I have client meetings, uh, client feedbacks, uh, that's showing us, uh, which right now that's at 100%. So, uh, well, I'm gonna go to Katie. And so we have um, our third uh, segment of this uh, survey is uh, KPI uh, metrics. Uh, so Katie, what, uh, what's going on here? Sure, so um, the question was, my monthly KPI metrics are viewed with a member of my organization and any concerning matters are discussed. So KPI is key performance indicators and a big part of what Christina and Taryn and I and the entire revenue cycle team does is analyze the charges, the payments, the entire revenue cycle. So what this question is asking is, do the clients and do the practices feel that we are reviewing those key performance indicators and the metrics with them on a monthly basis? And as you can see, um, all 28 responses are affirmative. Exactly, yeah. um, thank you. And then, um, Christina, uh, we can, if you can please cover the fourth one. So our fourth question was, the United Medical Manager assigned to my account is trained and knowledgeable of the solution industry and is meeting my needs. Um, for this question, 27 out of 28 had agreed on this. Um, as a team, we, we have a very strong support system here at United Medical, so when we go and we're talking with our clients, if there's any questions that we have on our end, we make sure that we, you know, we're able to solve that with the, the support system that we have here, um, if there are any questions that we need. And um, we do our best to make sure that we are knowledgeable with all of the current LCD policies that might be out there, any updates in regards to any of the ICD-10, et cetera. Um, we also do MGMA certification as well. So we do take pride in that, that, you know, we try to, meet all of those needs. I was just gonna tell, uh, tell and uh, talk about that so that part of the issue with the standard, standard um, way of providing the information and understanding the system and uh, the issues in healthcare, uh, certification is almost uh, required and, uh, and you are going through that right now. I know um, uh, with the MGMA uh, partnership that we have with MGMA. So that is standardizing, but uh, you are going through your process this year, right? Yeah. And KB got hers last year, uh, she's already certified. And the way that uh, that works, um, because there are different modules of what we do. So um, right now, Katie and Christina, they are on the RCM, uh, Revenue Cycle Management, part of the uh, healthcare um, practice. 
medical practice. But then uh, MGMA looks at that practice as one whole. And in that whole is um, HR, uh, accounting, uh, risk, uh, risk, um, uh, and then RCM related ones. And the, what's the fifth one I can, uh, of the uh, PCMH, like the patient, um, uh, uh, population health, which is now a new uh, pa- uh, new module for MGMA. So it helps us to have that standard structured uh, training uh, in a way uh, that we can get. But uh, I know that our team, they're all going through uh, that and that's that's helpful. Anything, anything you, uh, Christina, you wanted to add to that or Katie? I think you hit the nail on the head there on that one. You know, we're doing the best that we can um, to make sure that we're constantly um, staying up to date with any updates that are there and and making sure that we can improve um, on our own personal level, our our knowledge in regards to the field to make sure that we're better able to communicate and help our clients. Next question is uh, that we, these are again standard questions. So we have, uh, uh, it's around the achieving the outcome. So uh, Katie, if you would like to cover this one. So um, my expectations are being met by United Medical and my organization is achieving the outcomes and results that support our strategic goals. So um, just how we have goals in our own revenue cycle um, with the days in AR and looking at MGMA standards, we obviously want to support the client's goals as well, whether they are looking at specific risk scores for their clients or we're just looking at making sure that their days in AR and their revenue cycle is up to a certain standard. Um, We do try to work in our own goals and with their goals as well. So as you guys can see out of um, 28, we did have 27 that agreed with that as well. So we're happy to see that we are helping our clients to meet their goals. Excellent. So our last uh, one is, um, actually this is one thing that we need to fix is, I was actually trying to update them right before the session. That's why they're not in the PowerPoint. So one of the filters is off and that is, Uh, I think that's this one. So we asked about the payment posting team. So um, Christina, right? We're on Christina now. Christina? Uh, Yes, so this question is um, pretty self-explanatory with it. Um, Are you satisfied with the services provided by your payment posting team? So our team strives to make sure that everything that we get in, um, we post within a timely fashion to make sure that, you know, we're not going over in regards to the days, um, in regards to the months. So that make sure everything that we receive during the month gets posted properly within that month so that we're not missing out on any revenue in our end of month reports for the clients. So we wanna make sure that we stay on top of that. and it looks like on this question, 27 out of 28 had agreed. So we had a really good quarter uh, in Q1 2021. Uh, you know, one of the, I think, um, so I, I'm gonna ask this, uh, like it's not a question necessarily, but it's just my own take. Uh, what I see is there are certain um, standards that we have to provide, that's correct. And that's true for the regular, um, routine everyday type of work. But what happened last year uh, was uh, with the starting the pandemic in uh, March, uh, there was a big um, transition uh, needed to happen. And I believe how quickly we were able to actually uh, set up our daily meetings with the entire um, client base uh, nationwide. And we did that for several months and then we went down to like uh, twice a week now uh, from daily to twice a week. I think that made, uh, you know, everyone does something, but then to be special, you have to really take that extra uh, step, the extra effort that you have to show. And I think that's what we were, we are capable of. Um, uh, of course, I'm going to be biased because this is our company, but I, this is not something that I do by myself. Uh, I think we do it with the team, and that's why you guys are here with me. And I have a feeling that our satisfaction scores are better this year, even 
uh, I think it's improved uh, slightly because of the pandemic. Would you agree to agree to that or? I would agree. I think that, you know, right off the bat when this all started, um, you right away immediately had went and set up these meetings for the ACO. So everybody was on the same page for it. Um, I think that since we did raise to that level that was above the expectations of normal, like a lot of the providers did appreciate it. I know that I had received a lot of positive feedback as we were going, because since this was so new, um, not every, we didn't know where, which direction to go with a lot of this. So, so we were able to right up front, get everybody together and have everybody on the same page. And as updates came out, we made sure that we were on top of it and gave everybody the information that they needed. So we didn't run into any issues where there was any type of chaos. So I think that was really good on our end. And, and I know that from talking to some of the clients that I have in the past, they greatly appreciated it. So I think we're doing pretty good. We're happy, happy to hear that. Well, um, ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, so I'm sure I'll ask you again, um, we are going to now start my therapy session uh, with the cost of healthcare and uh, some of the issues with the hospital system, uh, how the nonprofit is actually taking advantage of our, uh, our um, Medicare, Medicaid population, perhaps. So I'm going to be sharing those uh, again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Uh, Mr. Tanner, uh, are we back home? Yep, coming up here in a second. So, all right, so what I'm going to do here is this time I'm going to mm -hmm. do this. Um, so let's try how that works for today. Okay, so um, just uh, to get to the same. Side. Uh, so this is this is us learning new stuff, right, Tanner? So <laughs> still working out the kinks. There we yeah. go. So I mean, we discussed the issues with the um, uh, emergency department utilization, uh, and then all these. It's been up uh, on this presentation the last couple uh, weeks. Mm -hmm. So. There is a, a nonprofit uh, organization called Delaware Healthcare Association. So this one um, is interesting. They, uh, they had an opinion on this uh, new bill that was introduced. Um, so Tanner, you studied that with me. This is the SB 227, right? Uh, yeah, and I apologize. I wanted to put up the actual um title of the bill, just in case if anyone was obviously unfamiliar. Huh? I'm sorry, go ahead. Hear me okay? Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, this bill that we are referring to is actually the um, primary care collaborative reform, which is something that we've discussed uh, for a handful of different sessions. And it was actually uh, topics of discussion that we had with Senator Townsend, uh, Representative Bentz, um, some of the healthcare uh, or the public leaders that have um, some influence in the healthcare uh, legislation. So that's what this is referring to. And, and that is a, a reform that is looking at how um, the healthcare committees in the state and some of the other committees who are making legislative decisions in regards to healthcare, particularly primary care in the state of Delaware, how those committees are actually formed, how they behave and uh, who is represented in these committees. So um, that's what this SB 227 is. The biggest problem that we have here, uh, Tanner, is uh, this organization uh, is it's almost like a lobbyer, uh, lobbyist for the hospitals. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I do have a strong opinion on when they call this uh, healthcare association. That's not true. This is the hospital association. And uh, you can check the... Uh, right. Uh, the well, that, that's interesting because that's reflected here. Uh, I think that that's why we wanted to, and like you mentioned, this is their response or initial um, remark regarding part of this bill. Um, so essentially, you can kind of see that here in the highlighted areas. Um, they're a little hesitant to, and a little upset with how it's currently laid out um, regarding the Medicare and Medicaid populations, kind of saying that we have to remember the hospitals 
are uh, what he what the what the healthcare association call here the primary safety net for providers as they're able to take on these populations in addition to commercial um, health populations. So that's kind of what their point is here and why that this would be a bad idea. This could possibly end up um, causing losses for um, the hospital system. So, but that's uh, far from the truth because uh, right. what we know is that this point that they made uh, Medicaid and um, Medicare, uh, if they are the only one who's taking, um, um, so uh, Anthony uh, is texting me saying that they are the hospital lobby. Uh, and mm -hmm. that is, uh, that's what I believe what I said. And right. what, what I was doing is their title is, uh, Anthony, uh, what, what I see here, like Delaware Healthcare Association is, should be renamed uh, as Delaware Hospital Association because we don't want this to be the opinion of the medical um, uh, society uh, of, I mean, us, like medical practices. And it's not, this is a hospital funded program or uh, organization. But our biggest problem that we had here is they're highlighting the nonprofit and they're highlighting, oh, this is hospitals are the only one that takes Medicare, Medicaid. That is bullshit. So that's a big bullshit because uh, that's not true. Uh, all of our practices. Uh, I don't know anyone who doesn't take Medicaid. I don't know anyone who doesn't take Medicaid. I'm not saying that there isn't any. Uh, knowing this system very well, uh, all I'm saying is 99% um, of the practices are taking Medicaid with our limited resources. And this guy, um, Mr. Wayne Smith, I know him, um, is in every state meetings. Um, but the problem is uh, that's misrepresenting the truth. So we all take Medicare, Medicaid. Now, speaking of taking Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, we also want to understand this: nonprofits are not um, immune from uh, legal issues. And uh, I wanted to share this latest one from 2018. Uh, many people, uh, unfortunately, these days people don't read, uh, but the Christiana Hospital was. Uh, Christian Hospital agreed to pay 3.3 million um, for uh, state and federal uh, charges for the Medicare and Medicaid fraud. So it's interesting how uh, Delaware Healthcare Association is um, uh, advocating for um, hospitals taking Medicare and Medicaid, but then when you read it with this one together, I'm like, well, you know, one of them is not true, and the other one is you're part of the uh, settlement like this with the kickback. That's not really good. So uh, I think that eleven. Was and there's a three point three. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a just in a little bit. Sorry, uh, didn't mean to interrupt Kamal. But if anyone is unaware or unfamiliar with exactly, it has it kind of highlighted up here what kickback scheme would be. In um, a little bit, we'll get into it, some information that actually. It talks about what that what that exactly entails. So um, this is an article that uh, it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. voicing our concerns related related to these news uh, update we have with Christiana and uh, Highmark partnership. So this was uh, was this in Washington Post. Uh, correct. Yeah, this was an op-ed piece from. Um, recently, I believe. Um, and I, like you mentioned, it's just highlighting and kind of um, voicing really the same concerns that we've been discussing week in and week out um, uh, on a national level. It's not necessarily something that's local. I know that we sometimes focus on um, uh, local hospital systems, of course, just because that's the population uh, that we're caring for in our offices. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this issue is not local. Um, it, it's certainly um, something that's seen elsewhere. So where I want to go from here is, uh, since it's my part of the therapy, um, so I do want people to understand that we are not crazy people. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing for a second. So uh, Tanner, uh, I know you and I, we discussed these issues prior to these. Um, I usually go through for the entire week to see what we should be presenting. And I mm -hmm. use your work from your side and then we put it all together. Now, mm -hmm. uh, and my discussions with you guys uh, usually is, and then this happens with the other team members as well. 
And sometimes I see you guys like, oh my God, is he really telling me the truth? Or because some, some stuff that I'm sharing with you guys, what happened in the healthcare industry is unreal. And then I can see in your eyes that you're questioning, well, let me just read exactly what he's talking about. I get that a lot from you guys. <laughs> nothing, nothing bad because I know it's unreal. And unreal yeah. are happening. So I'm going to actually show you guys an exercise of uh, our uh, biggest nonprofit and biggest employer of Delaware, Christiana Hospital. And we are going to examine their numbers. And these are public numbers. I do get some messages uh, in terms of where these uh, numbers are coming from. They are public, uh, available for public. Um, so you have to find it. So I spend my time and you have to spend your time. But ours is from guidestar.org. That's an organization that shares the nonprofits. Um, uh, financial numbers. So they have to, because nonprofit means is uh, people of this country are paying for the irresponsible decisions. So I'm going to just tell you this as much as I can in a way that you really need to understand as you mean our audience. So this is um, Christiana Hospital in years. So this is the, um, they have their um, uh, they have their uh, income statement in three main groups, uh, surgical cases. Uh, like actually, the one that we are going to discuss is this just surgical cases part of it. And then I'm going to go to the, um, the second uh, income group, which is the labs. And then the next one is the hospital uh, services. So Christiana Hospital, in year 2000, 10, 11 fiscal year, 2010 fiscal year, they did 40,000 cases, all right? So 40,000 is a total number of surgical cases. Profit margin was 42.5%. Actual profit from these services is 80 million. All right, so now when you compare this with the latest available, the 18, 19 timeframe, they have, um, they went down to 37,390 cases. Uh, profit margin was 45, and the profit was at 118 million. So now, first of all, for a nonprofit, I think this is a genius business when you are reducing your number of cases, but you are increasing your income. Your, you increase your profit margin by 45%, you, you see like this is the difference between 118 and 80 million. So what, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, hold on. so when the numbers went down on the 7%, so you are able to increase your profit margin to this level, which is um, pretty business genius. Like I think uh, Dr. Nevin is the new Elon Musk I thought I was, but I'm going to give that to her. So good job. So who's paying this? You, me, and everyone else. This is uh, the same uh, surgical procedures. So I'm going to actually just share the cost uh, per case numbers. So 4,695 was in 2010. Revenue that time was 6,705. And then in 2018, Cost went up to 6,900, and then revenue went up to 10,000. Now, although uh, the change on the cost uh, went up by 49%, they were able to increase the total revenue by 52%. Now, first of all, we don't know, uh, but we actually know why there was an increase on the cost, because that includes their number of people. Uh, if you have more or if you do spend more, if you have more or are running inefficiently, you are gonna be responsible for the cost. The cost of the surgery did not go up. Operation of the surgery did go up because we know this because we run a surgery center and uh, we have our own data from here. So I find this extremely interesting, uh, Tanner. Uh, so the other thing that I wanna kind of just to give the summary, like how the hospitals have to show their income. So this is what I was uh, looking in the beginning. 
So they, have, they, they look at their operation, operating room, which is the surgical cases, their labs. So Christiana Hospital was making money here. They're making money here. Somehow for the hospital, actual hospital services, they are losing money. Now, so I'm gonna explain this in a way that what's in there is the doctor's salaries, nurse salaries, medical staff, rent, benefits, like those are the ones that I can name quickly. Now, what I want us to kind of uh, remember is, so why are they paying their doctors more? So Tanner, I'm just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to have this dialogue. So sure. they pay more. So then they said, well, I'm gonna pay more on their salaries. We don't pay as much as they do for our medical staff. We lost someone last week to Christian Hospital because they were paying 20% more for, for MA. Why? Because they can be responsible financially. Then uh, they uh, rent more because they have more uh, bigger buildings. We do not need bigger facilities. We need quality facilities, quality providers. And I think Christiana Hospital is deliberately hospitals. Let's not just uh, make them, let's not um, single them out. Right. Hospitals are in charge of the expenses and then they are deliberately increasing the expenses. Now, uh, where these numbers are coming from, many people are questioning uh, or asking questions. So I'm gonna, uh, it may, I didn't wanna make it too complicated, but some really crazy changes are happening on, the, on their tax returns. Uh, and then I keep track of what Christiana Hospital does because they have uh, done so much uh, harm to us. And then we used to have so many contracts with them. So I want these things to be known by public. So these are the actual yearly numbers. So uh, Tanner, uh, it was, I don't know if it was you or Christian yesterday when I was mm -hmm. actually updating the numbers. So it was you, right? When we I, th looked at the, uh, I think it may have been Christian, I didn't have a chance to take a look at any of these yesterday. So if, I don't know if you guys are able to see these numbers, but um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Yeah, if you can zoom just a little bit. Uh, all right, so all of a sudden, like this is this number of staff that's used for the operating room. It mm -hmm. went from 285 to 610. And then we have to double check a couple of times because what we have seen uh, from 17 to 18, the nurses who were who was utilized who were utilized in the hospital care, professional care, went from 3,600 to 2,600. I think they swapped some people from here to there to show their profit margin uh, increase a little bit less. That's my uh, suspicion. I have no reason to believe that this is an honest mistake because they knew that it was going to increase because that's about 70,000 times uh, the difference between the two, that's about 22 million additional profit that would have been here. And I don't think they want this number to be shown here as like they're making 67% profit, as like they're doing here like 100 to 90 to 70%. So wherever they lose money, they actually make that in the, uh, in the other sections. And then this is- um, Right. So this was what we were looking at yesterday, Kamal. I apologize, I do remember. So just to be your point there, then that first block is actually the surgical cases and followed by those labs, uh, lab testing, and then the bottom is actually the, the patient care uh, in the hospital setting. Exactly. Right. And yeah. What I did last night, I said, you know what, let's look at 2010 to 2000, I mean, 2015, where uh, Dr. Nevin came in charge to okay. 2018, because you know, she was able to increase her salary by 34%. So I thought maybe she did really excellent uh, something. It's like something happened. And then during that time in four years, the um, only thing that increased is our healthcare cost. So the cost went up from, uh, went up by 269 million. Revenue went up by 236 million. So the profit uh, in total, uh, their profit reduced to 33 million from these operations. Now, I can't help but think about like, how, how, what did you do to deserve a 34% increase? Um, because this is a CEO job, it's pretty uh, you know, uh, settled in a way that um, like, it's not a new job. Like I'm sure in four years you are gonna make 
60, 70, 80 percent more tenor, hopefully. But when you are a CEO from one year to the next, unless you do something, um, it's not increasing at that level. When, right. when it's so, and then healthcare and Medicare and Medicaid money, um, I can tell that my income, Dr. Nevin, in the last four years did not increase by 34 percent. And I do more, like more in a way that I do more work now than mm. four years ago. What did you, what your organization, how did or, your organization actually uh, reward you for this 34% public money? While you also paid, if you remember Tanner, during that time, they pay for their former CEO, 3.3 million after he left. Four years, mm -hmm. time, uh, like in the four year time uh, duration, they paid 3.4 million for the former CEO. That sounds they right. Yeah. Salary. So Chris Coons, Tom uh, Harper, John Carney, uh, our attorney general, our insurance commissioner. I need you to do what I'm doing. I, I just look at these numbers and then look at it a little bit carefully because the expenses that we are trying to come up with, um, uh, the the way to fix these expenses and reduce cost, uh, reduce uh, healthcare costs, is not happening because hospitals are not willing to make sacrifices. So they still make big uh, profit margins. They still pay a lot for their CEOs. They still increase their CEOs' uh, total uh, compensations. And who pays for these? Us, mm -hmm. patients, right. Medicare patients. My eighteen-year-old. A patient who doesn't have secondary insurance and she has to get a second job, part-time job, is paying for the increases in inefficiencies in healthcare system. So I'm really uh, making this a public announcement to all of them to look into this. Now you are going to have this partnership with Highmark, which is the biggest insurance company. Uh, then who's going to control all this? So. We have our other session starting in six minutes yep. and I have to get out of my therapy and then be the uh, chairman of the surgery center. So uh, then they don't, our patients don't see why I'm upset from one to the next. So I'm gonna share more information with you guys next week. And every week, if 10 people learn what we are doing and what the issues we are dealing with, that's gonna make us happy. Now, on our United Medical uh, YouTube channel, we created certain uh, short videos for our patients, mm -hmm. uh, how quickly they can actually uh, uh, use the portal and uh, make an appointment, make a refill request and all that. Uh, there are small short videos and I think they are extremely mm -hmm. useful. And Tanner, I know you were part of that with our marketing team and thank you guys for uh, doing that and uh, we'll be back next week, same time.